Welcome to the Good Bad Mad podcast, a show that's here to share the ins and outs of creative careers, connecting the aspirational with the experienced, with your host, me, Meg Ellis. My guest for this episode is the wonderful editor, Jim Flynn. He talks us through the role of an editor and how much can change a film. He also gives us great insight into his work, including the famously popular Bridgerton. Hope you enjoy. Jim, hi. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Whereabouts are you at the moment? New York. Uh, no, I'm actually in uh, Rhode Island. My wife and I have a little, basically a beach shack here. Mm -hmm. um, that we bought because she's a school teacher and we would have summers here. Oh, nice. um, and when and the bottom fell out of everything, we kind of ran away to be here until LA gets better. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for taking the, the time out of your schedule. Um, of so the purpose behind us here at the Good Bad Mad is to kind of facilitate that information between those who have experience and and have have had successful careers with those who are just starting out so I'll, i guess i'll start with the basic question what does an editor do oh that's a big one <laughs> um that is the big question um basically what uh what we try to do what i try to do is um based upon the script and conversations that I have with the director, mm -hmm. I try to take the material that's that's uh, filmed mm -hmm. and using the picture and sound as best I can convey the intention of what, uh, of what the story is. Um, and sometimes I need to push it a direction closer to the script or sometimes the material will push me away from the script in a different direction and that's sort of where the movie wants to go. Um, but in general, I just try to tell the best story I can with with the with the pictures and sounds that uh, that the folks on set have have delivered to me. You know, I'm really the first member of the audience. I'm the first person to ever really see um, what the thing could be. So I try to I try to make that as 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 good as I can. You know, so I, I use my judgment for that, yeah. and then hopefully other people. You know after me like what I've done and we kind of work with that and, and make that better and better. So hopefully. when when do you get involved in the process? Is it as soon as shooting wraps up or is it before then? No, usually I'm involved uh, when they're doing what's called prep. So when you're having these initial conversations with your director, what is it you're talking about? Are you talking about how you want the story to flow and and what kind of energy you want at different points in in the story is that the kind of conversations you're having sure uh, and and certainly i i'll ask questions you know but I, but mostly what i want to know is is what they want what he or she wants out of the um out of the show and and how how impactful a moment could be you know um so my questions would be along the lines of um, hey, this little thing happens in this scene, scene 14, that's kind of sad. You know? mm -hmm. Should we kind of make this play up how, how sad this is? Mm -hmm. And the director would be like, no, 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 no. Let's keep like our powder dry because there's scene 27 has that devastating event. So mm -hmm. let's not wear out people emotionally at this point. Let's, you know, get them, hit them harder here mm -hmm. or, um, you know, just stuff like that, you know, or stuff, stuff where I say, you know, I, I read the script now, this scene, if done in this certain way, could play for comedy. Are we interested in making this scene kind of funny or do you want the scene to be much more serious? You know, just kind of feel out exactly what they're thinking. So when it gets to the point where I'm showing them mm -hmm. uh, their material assembled, I'm closer to the mark mm -hmm. uh, as far as what they're, what they're hoping to see. So do they like to have you on set? From the get-go, because I get uh, what's called dailies every day, which are um, rushes which is what they shot during the course of the day, I'll get that, you know, my assistant brings it into the system and then sends it over to me and then I start working on it. And if uh, there's something I feel like, boy, I really could use such and such, you know, I'll uh, reach out to the, the crew and say, hey, you know, it would be really great if, uh, if when she opens the drawer, you gave me like a POV of her necklace because, you know, she's gonna grab her necklace or whatever, you know, the, the mm -hmm. thing may be. And I'll, I'll, I'll be doing that while they're shooting. Um, uh, 
for a few reasons. One is because we get to, you know, be what's called cut to camera, which means I'm when they when they wrap, I've got something put together that they can look at. You know, these these sets, these crew, this these this talent is really expensive. And you know, if if they got to shoot that necklace in the drawer, it's much easier to do it. You know, the next day when on the same set, the woman's in the same costume. You know, all of the stuff is all still there. All the props are still there. It's much easier to do it that way than six months down the line be like, well, we really could have used a shot of the necklace. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then they have to restage it, get the woman back as the actress, get the, you know, crew and get the cameras and all that. So it's, it's cost effective for me to be on. Well, certainly the digital era has made um, our jobs quicker. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know that it makes it necessarily better, but certainly I'm actually from the celluloid era. I kind of cut my teeth. So I was also, I was an assistant for a very long time working and would, um, do what's called syncing dailies, which I would put rolls of uh, picture and sound up on a, a synchronizer block and splice with tape and, and a razor, the, the audio and the picture, and then give it to my editor and he would work on it. Mm -hmm. um, but we would do, we, it was, it was, uh, it was a similar process in that we would work from day one and we would get rushes or dailies. Um, I mean, the big difference is, is we would usually sit in a theater um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day and watch our dailies, which um, was kind of exhausting, at least for an assistant, because I'd been working hard all day and then they wrap at 10 o'clock at night. And then I watch dailies until, you know, 1 a.m. and then I'm back at it at eight. But that was, that was, there was a lot less sleep in those days, that's for yeah. sure. And there are some times when I get called onto a project um, that's kind of already rolling along. Um, that, that's kind of like trial by fire. That's sort of a situation, not my favorite situation where I'm just kind of jumping in, you know, after the fact. Um, it's all been shot. It's all been kind of at least, you know, put together and then, you know, trying to, trying to work in, in those kind of finds, which is a little, a little less fun for me creatively. So not, not only are you receiving footage and simply cutting it together, you are thinking creatively in terms of characters emotions and and different ways of telling the story oh sure for sure and and it happens quite frequently that you know we'll get through a you know an assembly of something and we'll uh, put it to a third party maybe a producer or somebody else involved in the process mm -hmm. and they'll say you know gee i really don't like character x and you're like hmm that never really occurred to us so mm -hmm. we'll go back into it and we'll kind of manipulate character x in certain ways you know maybe maybe she's on camera too long after there's a certain line and it strikes us as being mean or it'll be all these little things that add it up they'll have this Oh, you know, in the final analysis, she's kind of rude or she's kind of mean to the kid and she doesn't need to be. And with changes, you know, throughout, we can really make, make an impact. And, you know, obviously that happens when I'm looking at the big picture, but also in the little picture, you know, I can, you know, I, I can either communicate with the director and say, hey, you know, I, I think that, you know, this guy is being really, you know, mean to his wife you know, I'm going to take out these three lines because if he doesn't say this, you know, if he just finishes the scene with this and we don't go into that part where, you know, he, you know, he spills a drink on her, then mm -hmm. it's much more, we won't hate him as much. So we, we have to, we have a lot of minor adjustments that we can make over the course of it that have, have big, big impacts. And you'd be, you'd be surprised. We, we've made some pretty significant changes to, to things that, that surprise people when they find out. Is there a, a standard format to putting a scene together? Like, do you start with a wide shot, then go into um, POV shots and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly language. I think that the, the filmmakers, you know, certainly since, since the 70s and, and when I was a kid, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, um, sort of threw a lot of that on, on its head. There are still some conventions that we, we do like to um, make sure that, that we understand. From, from my part, um, I kind of like to, I like to, I like to reveal a scene. So um, my, my default tactic is go either inside um, the scene right away, which means um, going to coverage or going to tight stuff or going to, you know, something small, someone, you know, lighting a match. Mm -hmm. I'll go into a scene on the match lighting and then kind of then reveal, which is where I back out of the scene. And then I say, okay, here's the people that are in the room. There's, mm -hmm. and then these are all you know, here and where the relationship they are to one another. 
Um, sometimes the scene calls for open up on the wide. So you see, okay, this is where everybody is. And this guy over there is about to light a match, then go in and cut and see the guy lighting the match. Mm -hmm. um, my, again, my preference is I don't mind entering a scene and disorienting the audience a little bit. So mm -hmm. they'll see something and they'll be like, wait, where am I? What is this? It sort of wakes everybody up. It gets them recalibrated. And then you reveal to them, hey, this is where we are. This is why he lit the match. These are the people that are concerned mm -hmm. because they're doused in gasoline or whatever the scene happens to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm guessing your preference as an editor is for the film crew to get as many shots as possible. Well, I certainly, I, I, I've never complained to anybody that I have too much footage. Um, I'll take everything I can get. And a lot of times uh, crews will use multiple cameras. That's pretty common now on, on bigger budget uh, things because they have, you know, buying another camera and another crew is not that expensive compared to the sets they're using and the performances and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a lot of, um, uh, people call it B-roll or, or B-camera material. Um, I think it's great because sometimes you find just this weird little piece that, you know, no one would use conventional and it doesn't really seem to go, mm -hmm. but it's enough to kind of um, put emphasis on something that might not have gotten emphasis if it was just covered conventionally. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's that's the real benefit of having a lot of material. Now, another thing that happens with a lot of people who love this shot, you know, I was like, oh my God, I got this great shot and I really want to use it. But what I like to do sometimes is keep that shot, the most beautiful shot in the scene. Like I won't even use until the very end. So we've watched this whole scene and then we cut to this gorgeous shot and the sun is setting over the beach or whatever it is. And it's just like, wow, this is, it's really impactful. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, you know, people will watch the dailies and they're like, oh my God, this is a gorgeous shot. Why don't you use this shot more? And, you know, I always suggest, look, if I use it, it's like dessert, you know, if, mm -hmm. if I give you, you know, four desserts, it's not going to be that great. But if I wait till the end and give you a nice dessert, it'll, you know, Mm. It'll have an impact, but but no, I, I I'll take all the footage I can get. Weird stuff is great, but I, but I guess every every frame you include has to be moving the story forward somehow. For sure, yeah. Every every frame, every beat, every line, every scene, um, everything has to has to serve the story for mm. sure. It sounds to me like your your role is actually very creative as opposed to simply technical. Well, I I certainly think so. Yes, uh, we we have we have a we have a pretty significant uh, impact on the final um, on, on how how the story is is received for sure. There's a lot of you know, I mean, you could call it pressure, but I think it's great. You know, I lo I love what I do, I love doing it. I love shifting the tone of the scene. You know, I love taking these weird little scenes and making them funny, but they're not supposed to be. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I relish in that. And especially like you said earlier, if it serves this story really well, mm -hmm. you know, then, then it's, it's, it's to the benefit, but yeah. I mean, I, I, I work with uh, a lot of people that work with, you know, the director. Mm -hmm. um, in features, it's really the director and then ultimately the studio. Um, and in, I've been doing series lately, a few Netflix series. And in that case, it's, uh, there's a couple more, um, levels. There's a there's the director of the episode, and then there's someone who's called the showrunner, mm -hmm. and they're kind of like the director of the series. And then there's you know, the executives, and then there's the Netflix people. In my case, uh, there's a, a few more cooks in the kitchen with with series, but they, I've had some really great experiences. Do they all sit in in the edit suite with you? Not usually. Um, usually, I'll work uh, for Bridgerton, for example. Um, I worked with um, I worked with two directors on that, jo Julianne Robinson and Tom Verica, and they would come in and work with me for two or three weeks, I want to say, mm -hmm. and then uh, Chris Van Dusen, who was great, uh, would come in and work with me um, for much more time, and then he became sort of the voice of uh, uh, Sean Shonda Rhimes, who was the the really the the head. Of, of Shondaland, her company. Mm -hmm. And th the notes were coming through her to him. And then I would sit and work with, with them. And then we would, you know, show Shonda or show mm -hmm. um, Betsy or the other the executives mm -hmm. at Shondaland. And they would, um, you know, comment on it, give notes. You know, I, I wish we spent more time in this scene and less time in this scene or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So there, there's, there was cooks in the kitchen, but they were all very, very, really, really helpful. So I, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind that particular. 
when did you first show an interest in editing? I think when I, when I was in school in the 90s, I went to um, Emerson College, which is in Boston. And I studied film and I always felt most comfortable in the editing room. Um, just because sets to me are kind of chaotic mm -hmm. and there's a lot of sort of waiting around and there's a couple people that are really, really engaged. And there's a lot of people who really are not engaged. Mm -hmm. And it felt like there's a lot of, I'm not, it's not wasted time. It's time that's essential and necessary. Mm -hmm. But I felt like when I went into the cutting room with the things that I'd been working on, I could spend all day mm -hmm. focusing on, on doing that work. And then when I came out to Los Angeles, um, I worked in a, for visual effects on a movie. Um, and part of my job as the visual effects guy was to carry, you know, print film in the room. Um, <clears throat> this movie called Terminal Velocity. <laughs> um, so I, I would drop off the, the film in this room and, and film cutting rooms at the time were like wonderlands. There was tons of people. There was, there was two editors, a man named Ray Lovejoy who edited 2001 Kubrick's movie. And there's a guy named Peck Pryor who I, I, I probably owe a phone call to, I haven't talked to him in a while, but he's a good friend. Um, and they, uh, they were each working on what are called chems, which are these sort of flatbed machines with a big, I think if I showed you a picture of them, you would, you would recognize it, but they're, they're just two discs of film and they sort of roll them through a projector head. And yeah. you know, it looks, you know, it's a pretty important, impressive piece of equipment. And then there are some synchronizers and there's a coding machine that's, that's stamping the film with numbers to see so you can make sure you're always in sync. And I was just, I was kind of mesmerized. I was like, what is this place? It's just so full of, you know, weirdness. Um, and so I started hanging out with, uh, with those guys, um, a guy named Greg Plotkin, um, who's actually gone on to, to, to some great success. He directs now, he direct, he edited a um, Get Out. Mm -hmm. um, and he is, uh, he kind of was like, hey, you know, we became friends and he was kind of like, hey, I do this, you want me to show you how to do this? And then he kind of showed me how to do that. And then, you know, I just, I work with some really great assistants and some really great editors. And I spent a lot of time in cutting rooms learning for, from really some of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you find that transition from celluloid to digital? Were, were you all for it or were you putting on the brakes? Uh, no, I mean, I was all for it. Um, I had, it was kind of, it was, a, it was like a weird time um, in, in post-production um, because what they would be would be um, really kind of computer people um, mm -hmm. that were, they, they were able to run this software, which was very expensive at the time. And it was, you know, rare and very few people had it. And then there were the film people, you know, mm -hmm. most of the editors, you know, were, were film editors and they were kind of acclimating to using the software. Um, and my transition really was, I would take lists of, um, uh, editing softwares and they would give me the list and they would say here we're using this piece um and i would take uh i would take the film off the shelves and i would take, put all together all the pieces that you know the editor had assembled on this you know avid and then we would finally go into a into a screening room or a theater and watch you know the edit because the editor really didn't it was hard on the editors because they couldn't really see the image that the, the resolution and the images in those in those early systems was was really bad um so we would kind of put it all together for them and then we would watch it. And then in that time frame, I would at every possible, you know, opportunity, I mean, obviously I saw which way the wind was blowing and I would go into, you know, into the avid room and just say, hey, can you show me how to do this? Can you show me how to do that? You know, really, it wasn't anything that anyone was learning at college at the time. And it was, it was, there was a bit of a learning curve, but um, it's, it's interesting how, how much of, film still lives on in in the in the software itself for instance in avid which is sort of the industry standard for movies uh, where you keep your scene is in bins now these actually used to be metal bins with hooks on them that we would hang film in and in fact if you look at the in and out points um, on a avid um, keyboard i might be able to show you can you see this yeah. This right there, that's that's an in and out point, I and O. Now, if you look at that shape, what that shape was to match 
is a thumbnail. So what the idea is that the editor would look and that's one thumb and that's the other and that's the in point and that's the out point. So there's a lot of little things that are kind of, you know, it's sort of like Shakespeare. You find it throughout literature. Yeah, and it's I do too. Stuff where there's a lot of terminology. Yeah, there's a lot of terminology and a lot of systems that, that have, have, you know, survived through the ages. And, and, you know, it gives me joy whenever I find a new one. So this, what was it called, Avid? Yes, Media, Avid. Avid's the name of the software company. Media Composer is the. Is and is that is that similar technology to say Adobe Premiere Pro, or is it very specific? For sure, for sure. I I think I think um, I mean there were really there were really um, three in the running about five or six years ago, maybe more than that. It was Avid, which was the standard, and everyone used it. Um, and then it was Final Cut, which was um, a pretty powerful Macintosh version. And then Premiere came out. Mm -hmm. um, Premiere is great. So movie on Premiere a few years ago, and I thought it was great. And I and I would still use it now. Mm -hmm. um, the the issue with Premiere that I find is the um, sharing information and sharing bins and sharing media with assistants becomes difficult in Premiere. Mm -hmm. Avid kind of has the the lock. On good at that but but you you could you could set up a premiere project to look almost identical to an avid project and mm -hmm. most editors would be fine with it they could walk into it mm -hmm. um so if you uh or other students that you you work with or other editors you work with are using premiere they're fundamentally doing the same the same tasks yeah starting out as an assistant i would recommend that anybody could learn you know they should learn teach themselves as much as they can avid and premiere and uh, and probably um, Da Vinci, mm -hmm. but Premiere and Avid, I think, are are the most widely used. And I think I think to early to your earlier question, if you are very very familiar with Premiere, you could pick up Avid pretty quickly, and vice versa. Brilliant. So, what what do you rely on your assistants to do? It depends upon the project, but but primarily, what my assistant will do for me <clears throat> is just get all the material organized because the material coming from set is is just a chaotic mess. Mm -hmm. So I need him to, to break this uh, material into shots, setups, scenes. Mm -hmm. um, if there's multiple cameras, I need him to, to group those so that, you know, if I'm in a camera, I can just hit a button and see what the B camera is doing at that same moment. Mm -hmm. um, I'll need him or her to uh, take what I've done at the end of the day I'll give them the stuff and they even out some of the audio for me or add in sound effects or do color work or if there's any sort of like effect, you know, like <clears throat> like if, if I have a two um, profile and I like the reaction from take four on the woman on the left and I like reaction from take six from the guy on the right, I'll sometimes just do a sloppy split screen and use what I want from each of them and then I'll give them to my assistant and she will make that split screen look a lot better than I can. And I don't want to spend all my time like perfecting how the split screen yeah. looks. I just want, this is basically what I want. Or if there's like a gunshot, I'll just grab any gunshot sound effect and put it in there and be like, okay, because I know that my assistant, and they'll know this about me after, you know, on a few projects. Okay, this is just a marker. He doesn't mean that this is how it should sound. He's just saying, hey, you know, yeah. this is this is the sound of the guy knocking on the door, and they'll make it sound better for me. So, so your your quick effects look better. Your focus is on, I guess, the entire picture. Then you're like, okay, this is how we do it, and then this like special like specificities of everything go to the underlings. <laughs> yes, there's just some things. There's just some things that are very time consuming. Mm -hmm. And doing uh, doing sound mixes, putting sound effects in, mixing the music, mm -hmm. um, I will I'll, I'll put that on my assistant so that I can focus on picture because I'm ultimately a picture editor. That's my job title. So I really want to make sure that the story is being told mm -hmm. and that you know all the characters are, are are doing what they should be doing. And if I spend you know, 45 minutes making a shotgun sound like it's coming from the left side of the room from outside the window, it, it would be a waste of my time. Um, mm -hmm. So I use my assistant to get me set up and prepared to work. And then after I've worked, I get them to kind of polish it up, 
make it sound better, make it look better. Sometimes a shot will, for some reason, come in and look really blue. And so mm -hmm. when I cut to it, it looks really blue and they'll be able to apply a color effect on it and things like that. So, I mean, my assistants are pretty busy. When, when you're working on a, a project, um, say, say a series like Bridgerton, you have a, a very different, it seems like a very different pace from the beginning of the series to the end of the series. Like suddenly there's a lot more energy towards the end of the series. Um, are, are those transitions that you're thinking about from the very start? Well, I mean, it, 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 it depends primarily, but, but a lot of times um, we want to travel somewhere <clears throat> and we either do it in a movie or in a series. So mm -hmm. if, um, if you come out, you know, I mean, obviously Bridgerton just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, and the stakes go up and there's more and more consequences. Mm -hmm. I, if you try to sustain that, like we were talking about earlier in the thing, like there's a sad scene in 17 and there's a sad scene in 28. Mm -hmm. If you try to sustain that level, you'll lose the impact. So a lot of times in a movie or a series, you'll be like, let's do it this way and then we'll evolve and we'll evolve. And so when you look, when you put a scene from the episode one up against the scene from episode eight, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, this is, we've really transitioned. We've carried the audience from this one thing you know, that what they thought was important here, what mattered to them here, what they thought was beautiful and wonderful here mm -hmm. is different now. And what they thought was awful and stinky and gross here, they think is beautiful now, you know what I mean? And that's sort of where we want to go. So we don't ever want to go all the way right up in the beginning. Let's, let's do this, you know, with, with, you know, waves and flows and things like that, but it's going to yeah, shows and, and try to try to build and try to accelerate. So does does the genre of of the piece you're working on really affect your editing decisions? You know, sometimes it does. And I think when I started working on Bridgerton, I my instinct was kind of maybe we should go at it a little bit like the crown, you know, like this is this beautiful place, this is really stately. But I realized that the material and how it was kind of going, it felt too stale. So we were like, well, let's pretend that we're in this crown genre, but really we'll be in this kind of fun, dancey, you know, exciting, sexy mm -hmm. genre, you know? It, it became more of a, we almost kind of wanted to, what they call bend the genre or, 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 or almost do a head fake and say, yeah, we're doing this, but really what we're doing how we're really going to present this will be much more, you know, stylistically to to the, either not period, yeah. more modern. You know, that's kind of how how we approach Bridgerton, and and it was it was a lot of fun to do it that way, and it you know it it, it made it really really fresh, you know, and it, it felt just really alive. I think mm -hmm. that's what we were we were really going for. Yeah, genre can can have have a deep impact. Obviously. Um, the genre is going to be reflected in how it's written, right? And the genre is going to be reflected in how it's performed. Yeah. Like that. So certainly I'm almost compelled, you know, as an editor to do, uh, to do things. Although sometimes we have fun, you know, and I'm sure you've seen some of those like uh, trailers, uh, like where they have the, the trailer for The Shining as a romantic comedy and things like that, which are just really, really fun. Yeah. So you can sometimes, and I will sometimes as a joke, uh, present to uh, my horror director, a comedy version of their scene. And uh, sometimes that's a lot of fun. So you can, <laughs> you can play with it like that too. But usually you try, to, you try to give people, you know, what they're expecting, but surprise them as frequently as possible as well. I mean, just the very fact that you can do that shows how much power you have as an editor. You know, I mean, people always say, fix it in post. Um, and I do, I do, I, I was chatting to, um, uh, visual effects guy the other day and he was like no it's, it's a really great tool to, su to support the filmmaking that you do on on set no one should rely on it but it, it certainly does um, have that um, little backup <laughs> in the corner for sure right well I mean we certainly don't like to hear fix it in post because that means that they didn't do something that they were to do um, but at the same time it, the, there are challenges and there are you know there are some times where I'm asked to do something that just was not shot that that's not how they shot it right. and you know they want you know 
they want to see it in a di completely different way than how it was shot. And that, you know, if they have to do it a lot, it gets really tiresome. Um, but it's nice to kind of work those muscles, you know, and I think that uh, kind of when I was um, getting started, when I was transitioning from being an assistant to an editor, I got a lot of really small movies and they were, didn't have much money. And um, I think I think that's almost to, to a benefit to, as a young editor, be put in these positions where you're like, I'm supposed to have a bear attack this woman in a tent and there's no bear and there's no tent. So you manufacture these things out of the weird you know material that you have and you sort of make it work somehow and i think you know it's it's good to kind of flex that muscle and every once in a while you know even on these big budget things i'm like i'm asked to kill a woman in a tent with a bear and i don't have any of those elements but i'll you know i'll do my best and we'll put it together and we'll see what we've got and sometimes you know people see it on their screen at home and sometimes they don't as in, as in you would have to bring in visual effects and that kind of thing to just make it happen or? Sometimes visual, I mean, obviously it's an extreme example. I've never had to make a, a scene where that happens, but certainly there are some times where, you know, we need to add a character who wasn't there, but we realize that, that character should have overheard this conversation. So what do we do? And I'm like, well, of that guy, you shot him in that room for a completely different scene. I can cut away to him. If we frame out the window and time it for night, it could look like he's there listening to that thing and we can sell it. And sometimes we get away with it. Amazing. That's just yeah, astonishing yeah, to, a lot of that. to hear. What's the, the, the biggest myth that um, people think about your profession and which is just completely untrue? Well, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit. I think a lot of people sort of assume uh, that what the editor does, it just, he just cuts out the boring parts. And mm -hmm. they did have right on set. The, the editor just took out all the stuff, you know, you didn't need and boom, you know, the mm -hmm. writer and the actor did it. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, we, we, we have a lot of, you know, we have to change sometimes performances. We have to, you know, add nuance, you know, to scenes, we have to realize that things aren't working as well as they should. We have to sometimes um, move scenes from one part of a show to another part of a show, remove scenes. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of responsibility story wise, you know, and it's and it's and and honestly, I, I don't really mind necessarily that people don't think too much about the editing because it's sort of an editor's trope where mm -hmm. if people recognize the editing, then you've done something wrong. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't mind sort of being behind the screen somewhat, but but it's certainly it's certainly misunderstanding of editing to think that it's just taking out all the boring parts for mm -hmm. sure. Do you do you think you could make, say, a bad acting performance a good one? I, I think I think a, a editor can certainly have an impact on a performance, can really help actors out. I, I try to help actors out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I I did a lot of work with a, a, a director named Nick Cassavetes, and from him, I really learned a lot about performance. And <clears throat> I carry his lessons with me, you know, as, as often as possible to work on performances um, and give the actor the best chance to, to, to really get the point across, not leave them twisting in the wind. I mean, you'd be surprised if you leave 12 frames at the end of a line delivery, that just, the line can fall so flat. Mm -hmm. um, so you really got, you really, I call it protecting my actors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I do that. And, and at the same time, you know, a bad editor, no one in this room, Mm -hmm. uh, could could do some damage, you know. Could could leave an actor, like I say, hanging, or yeah. leave a beat in that that shouldn't be there. That adds something to a performance that you know maybe the actor didn't intend, or in mm -hmm. the final analysis, really harms that that person's performance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I talk to actors quite frequently, um, and and ones that have been around for a while are very very appreciative of, of mm -hmm. what I do. Well, I guess this is the the thing to remember. Um, as a, as a filmmaker rather than a consumer, is that films aren't, are made in this kind of vacuum space, aren't they? You're not, you're not doing scene after scene after scene, it's shot out of order. And like you say, there's a couple of beats before someone yells cut. It's not a natural thing as much as you're trying to make it seem like it's natural. So I guess, I guess your job is to, to make it seem as natural and as fluid as possible. 
Yeah, and sometimes that's easy. Mm. Um, I'm sometimes, you know, it depends on the director, it depends on the script and the material mm. and the actors, and sometimes they make it really, really easy for me. Mm. You know, I mean, like um, Alec Baldwin, I edited Alec Baldwin. He he lets me know when to cut it. He's I'll, I watch cut here, and it's really obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and then others are not so so easy to work with. But certainly, like you said, I want to make it seem as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I want all the dialogue to seem as natural as possible, not too dramatic, not too crazy, depending upon the scene, you know. And then, you know, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to be, make all these dramatic cuts that calls attention to, oh, look what the editor did, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd really rather not do that. I'd rather you just kind of go with the scene and you're supposed to feel scared in the scene. Let's make yeah. sure they feel scared and not saying, wow, what a good edit. Yeah. That would, that would be bad for me. I was going to say, I mean, you've, you've done opposite ends of the spectrum, really, with um, haunting of, what's it called? Haunting of Hell Manor. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Hill House. Um, the second season of Bly Manor. Well, I that was do, it. I, I, I was did do Hill House. Yeah. The cinematographer who did Bly Manor. That's why I was. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hill House and then Bridgerton. They are complete opposites in terms of genre and, and I guess, the way you would approach it. Sure, you know, and and you know, uh, uh, and also it's it's sort of a a, um, a truism. In, in my profession is sometimes you get kind of put into a box and they say, oh, he's the horror guy. Let's get the horror guy to do this horror thing that we're doing for horror horror. Mm -hmm. And um, I really have, I've long tried to avoid that. And I, mm -hmm. I take, I sometimes take projects just because they're out of genre. And I'm like, well, I haven't done this in a while. So let mm -hmm. me do this. What What's your favorite element of editing? Do you enjoy the sound, the color, the the characters, the performances? Do you have an element that you you love? You get a bit giddy about when you're doing the get giddy part, and this happens much more in movies than it happens in series. But when you go for a laugh, mm -hmm. um, and then you go into a theater full of people and they laugh where you kind of were leading them to, and you wanted to, you know, and they get scared. Yeah, um, that's a real that's a real thrill for me. That's my, that's what gets me giddy. What, what I enjoy probably the most is day one dailies. I, I, I'm ready to go and I get my first scene and I'm putting my first cuts in. That is a really gratifying, really gratifying feeling. I love does, it. Does that first day for you then, the, the first time you, you do a cut, does that set the tone for what the rest of it's going to be like? Or do you have some flexibility after you do? You know, it, it, when I'm beginning, I like to leave everything really, really loose. Um, it's sort of like, <clears throat> I just made a bed for my daughter mm -hmm. in her room. So when I got the thing, they said, don't tighten all the screws just yet because you know the way you have to assemble it, you might have to move some, jiggle it around a little bit. And I kind of feel the same way about cuts. Mm -hmm. When I'm getting into a project, everything is kind of loose. You know, there's more time than I need. I use every shot that was shot. I'm really, really loose. And then as I'm working with it, it's as it makes more sense to me, and as it starts to speak to me more, I really start to tighten those screws and find where I can get more time out and see where I really want to spend my time. So it's it. it I hope I'm answering your question, you know, sort of a roundabout way, but I like to. I like to live in the cut for a little while before I really start making those tighter decisions, you know. I, I guess things can change, you know, spontaneous bits of film could come your way and suddenly that that changes the scene. So having that flexibility is key until you kind of do the first, first draft. For sure. And also to that point, there is when you take things out, they have a hard time finding their way back in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much easier to look at something and say, I don't really need that and I don't really need that. It's harder to look at something and say, what else could I have? You know what I mean? It's it's easier for the brain to deduce. How many edits would you say you do for say a typical feature film? Uh, a, lot. a lot. I mean, each scene gets reworked over and over and over again. Um, but on a, on, on a normal feature, um, just the big cuts, they would be, let me see, I would have the editor's first cut, then there would be um, a director's first cut, and then a producer's cut, uh, probably a studio cut, maybe an executive's cut, then a studio cut, um, and then a 
a final cut, but each of those have gone through multiple iterations. Yes. So, I mean, how many how many versions of, of say episode one Bridgerton I had? Mm -hmm. Probably north of eighty. I mean, it was there was so many different ways that we looked at it and changed it and, and made differences. Yeah, I mean, some differences were small and some were, some were big, but yeah, we we you know we had. We tried to do a lot with that with that thing, and it was you know, it was it was a lot of work. Oh my goodness! But that's just I'll do forty five myself before anyone else sees it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But again, I, I work in scenes, and then it? I'll work in the big picture. What's that? You ever get bored of watching it? It's a real concern. Uh, so I, a lot of times I, I don't like to work weekends. And if I'm working, if I'm, if I have my weekends, I'll, I'll take my weekends off. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just, if I'm working on something and I'm just, I've fallen into it, I'll just jump onto a whole new section or a different episode in, in the case of Bridgerton and work on that for a couple of days. And then when I come back to episode one, I'll be like, that's the problem. That's what I didn't see. But yeah, you can, you can, it's called, uh, we, we call it falling into it where you just don't even see it anymore. Mm. You know, it's not funny to you anymore. It's not sad to you anymore. It's yeah. not beautiful to you anymore. It's just, you've just worked on it for too much. And I, and I, you know, I think that I step away from my system, you know, whenever I feel that way, or I move on to a different section if I feel that way. And I think it's mm. really, really important. And I think that sometimes you do get blinded by it where you just, and then you get up the next day and you watch it, you're like, what was I doing? This is garbage. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta make sure that it stays fresh to you. And that's, that's a challenge somehow, that's a challenge sometimes because you, uh, I mean, th there's some comedy in Bridgerton for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and for comedy, it's hard sometimes because you do it and it's fresh and it's funny and you show everyone and they laugh at the joke and they're like, that's so funny, this is great. And then after the 24th time they watch it like, ah, it just doesn't seem that funny to me anymore. Can we change it so that it's funnier? And you end up changing out of something that was really quite funny to begin with. It's just that people have seen it enough that they're bored. And that happens with all genres. Yeah. Horror, this isn't as scary as it once was. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you knew the zombie was gonna jump out. So, <laughs> but you know. No, okay. And so that's why it's valuable to, to show people, um, you know, other folks that can, you know, come or put it in a screening room and just have a bunch mm -hmm. of strangers come in and watch it and just gauge their reactions to it. That's mm -hmm. always really helpful. Can I ask, do you, as, as an editor in, in, in the industry, have, have an opinion on, say, this big um, Warner Brothers, Zack Schneider edit debacle that's going on? Honestly, I, I I don't really know enough to to comment on mm. it. Um, I know that I know that studios <clears throat> want certain things, and that sometimes is in contrast with what the director or the mm. editor want. Um, certainly, you know, I've been in situations where the studio has met resistance from the creative uh, teams that I've been working on, mm. and you know, we always try to find a way to work it out. I'm a big advocate of sort of listening to both sides, trying it out, objectively looking at the, the changes and see if we like them. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if there's a better version of the, the DC movies, great, you know, let's, let's mm -hmm. share them with the world. I, I, I like there to be one version, one movie. Mm -hmm. um, but so and, you, and you come across these, these head bushings quite a lot I mean just you were saying earlier with all, all the executives and all of that like I'm sure there are some strong opinions for sure yeah there are definitely some strong opinions and there are sometimes you know sometimes there'll be camps where you're just like I'm with this and I'm with this and you know it gets to be kind of unpleasant sometimes um, luckily I haven't had too much of that although I've heard some absolute horror stories um, but the sometimes people just want something different, you know, and sometimes the director will say, look at, I want this movie the way that I've made this movie. Mm -hmm. And the studio will say, you know, A, we can't market it this way, or, you know, um, you know what that happens a lot. Um, there's been a lot of horror movies that have come out in the last well, 10 years that are PG 13. And I feel like whenever I do a horror movie, 
they the studio always wants it to be PG-13 because they sell more tickets, right? Because it's right. that whole other population. But the directors always want to be R because they want it to be really scary and they, you know, they want all the blood and the gore or whatever they want. So that happens a lot there. That just sounds like so an oxymoron, it's, it's a like PG-13 that. horror movie. <laughs> no, I mean, I did a movie called The Forest, which was PG-13. And I remember uh, we had a lot of conversations about that. Can we go R? And then it was ultimately decided, look, if we just clean it up a little bit, we can do PG-13 and, you know, hopefully we'll sell more tickets and more people will see it. And that was kind of the, the conclusion we came to. But, you know, sometimes it's not that amicable. I guess even, even the editor is... Uh not not free from the creative headbutting that goes on no for sure but you know we're we're sort of in a position and as creative as I, I, I as i think my career is i sort of am in a position where i'm i'm in the business of you know pleasing mm -hmm. uh my director usually primarily and then you know my studio and the people mm -hmm. that employ me i'm i'm really in the business of making them happy and certainly mm -hmm. if they want me to go in a direction that i feel really strongly against i'll raise my concern and tell them look if we do this then no one's going to care about this little girl in her sled um but if we i'll do it and you can see you know and, and sometimes i'm listening to and other times they're like you know what mm -hmm. we don't care about her sled yeah but right i guess that's it sometimes people just need to see the product of those ideas before they can um for sure put one yeah, again. i do a lot of show and tell for sure i have one more question for you to to surmise what are the good bad and mad things about your career as an editor oh <laughs> the all right let's try this um i think the good thing about being an editor is the voice I have uh, in the final product of, of a show or a movie. Uh, I take great pride in that and, and, and nothing really makes me happy. Um, the bad, the, the, the thing that people complain about most as an editor is having to deal with a lot of notes, a lot of notes from executives, a lot of notes from creative executives, a lot of notes from studio people who really weren't involved in the project in the beginning, who are just kind of signing up or sometimes just assigned to the to the project mm -hmm. halfway through or you know very recently that imagine it to be something completely different. And that is maddening mm -hmm. um, to have to make concessions for somebody who is ostensibly you know, in charge of a project that wasn't there through the entire process. I think that's that's the hardest part of my job. Um, and, and then mad, you mean mad in the British way? As in any crazy things that you just love, <laughs> the weird things that you end up doing. Uh, I think, I think the, the, like, I think, I, like I said earlier, the most wonderful thing about doing what I do is the opportunity to sit with a bunch of people or what happens a lot in streaming is they'll be like they'll they'll do like some kind of watch where there's a hashtag and you can follow it on Twitter and mm -hmm. watching people react um to uh to the scenes and, and, and get it or not get it or think mm -hmm. it's funny or or cry or do whatever. I remember once I worked on a movie with a, a fantastic editor named Paul Hirsch. It was with Beyonce and Cuba Good Jr. And it was about going to uh, a, a inner city Los Angeles theater and we screened it for these people and these gospel numbers, people were so excited about it. They were standing up in the aisles and dancing and singing along. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of the most remarkable cinema experiences I've ever had. It was really, really Oh, great. that sounds so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it was really great. Jim, thank you so, so much. I have certainly learned a few a few lessons from you right there absolutely it was my pleasure thank you for listening to this episode of the good bad mad podcast please subscribe to check out the next episode or leave a review if you liked it you can find us on instagram at goodbadmad or at goodbadmad.com for additional resources and information see you next time